sports. I'm very, very happy to be here. In fact, I, I said to myself this week that once I made it through this week, then I, it's another testament that there is a God of God. Amen, and amen. Then Helen called came, and then I said to myself, how could I say no to Helen? Hmm. How could I say no to Pintorio? That's Stacy Rose. All right. Mm. Right, that's Steph. Mm. Steph Lee, my good friend. You don't catch up this often now, Steph. Mm. And Joanne. Mm -hmm. And so many others. I am so happy to be here. Amen, amen. Poor Harry fell victim to. What has happened to me is that I noticed about 5 o'clock this morning, my phone was harassed by folks from all over the world. Hmm. Let me tell you what happened. Somebody got on to Adventist Today, that international journal, and published the stories about sexual harassment at the University of Southern Caribbean. Oh States. boy. And so you had folks calling from all over. Um, Spectrum Magazine wanted a statement from me. Um, everyone just going after the phone. So poor Harlan, when he called me this morning, fell victim to the fact that I resumed the post Sabbath posture of my phone. <laughs> I put it on silent, permanent. <laughs> While sitting there, got a text from the former editor of the Adventist Review asking me if there was a response to the article in Adventist today. Ladies and gentlemen, the most I will continue to say is that at the University of the Southern Caribbean, we do not condone or uphold sexual harassment okay. of any kind, Amen. And in any form. Mm -hmm. Any victim, once brought to my knowledge, will be dealt with according to the laws of the Republic. So, have no fears, man. Let's keep doing what we need to do and address the business. Amen. We're in church today. Amen. And um, I'll deal with those who harass the phone after church. <laughs> take my time. Um, the time. The topic from today, uh, Roxborough. Does the name Jassia ring a bell to you? Your nephew. Great. I'm glad to meet um, Jassia's uncle. Um, But I had him share with me that the emphasis would be on evangelism. And I want to tell you that truly we have a work, a real work to do. August 13, 2010 would forever be a day that remains etched in my memory. I had journeyed far out of town. And then I got a call about a small aircraft crash deep in the heart of the interior of the island. When I understood where the crash occurred, I realized that there was, with the best, highly skilled special force evacuation, the folks could not have been alive no matter how fast we got to them, because of the unforgiving geographical territory. It was mountainous. So to rescue them, the guys had to land about 10 miles away from the crash site and walk to the crash site, etc. But as the day went on, I discovered that the pilot of that small aircraft was a very good friend of mine from high school and then it's when the sadness and the pain crept in because I realized that I had spoken to him two days ago, two days before the crash and he was beaming and teeming with the pleasure of his two week old son. Wow. Two Days later, he crashed 
and only God knows what his last moments were. And I sat down and I said to myself that while we spoke about his son's birth, he made one request of me. And that request was that I be present at the dedication of his son. And I remember how I excused Khalid, my busy schedule at the time, to prevent me from being at that dedication. And since then, I've come to the very settled con conviction that when we are to spread God's words, it might not be on that tent, but it will be in our everyday interactions with people, with everyone. Yes, everyday interactions. So we should not just simply confine our witnessing endeavors to the period of time when we stand on the table. However, enough of my talking, let's get into the word. First Samuel 23 is the book. The specific passages run from as far as verse 14 and ends at verse 28. If you ask me, by the way, we have a young theologian in the midst, Brother Allen, and you know we like to tease the young theologians, Brother Jamal Pompey and his fiancée. If they are to ask me if what I'll caption the presentation today, I'll caption it, game is over. But nevertheless, our scripture reading from 1 Samuel 23, verse 40 says, and I want you to pay attention to the dynamics of this verse. It says what? And David abode in the wilderness in strongholds. And what? Remained in a what? A mountain in the wilderness of Ziph. So David is already discomforted. He's away from home. He's in, 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 in strongholds. He's in a mountain. He's experiencing the elements of nature beating upon his human torso. He is stressed with the thought that Saul is after him. He is alone. This promised child of God who was to be anointed king now finds himself as a fugitive. Life seems to have rub him the wrong way. And the verse ends by saying, saw, saw him once a week. It ends by saying what? Saul saw him every day. Think about this. Out in the wilderness. Taking a beating from the elements. Everything seems to be going wrong, Reggie. And by the way, it's so good to see Reggie today. Right? Um, everything is going wrong. And then Saul comes after you every day. And the text ends by saying what? But God, who? God delivered him not into his hands. Which you have. Bible still open to 1 Samuel 23. Father in God, guide us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. We once again confronted with the struggles of a prominent Old Testament character. David, when others saw a shepherd boy, God saw a king. We once again confronted with the narrative of one who looked kingly, one who stood head and shoulder above everyone else, one who fit the bill for the job, but God did not call him. We are once again confronted with the facts of a man understanding that God had rejected him and decides that he will twist the narrative and carve out his own niche to stay in kingship and stay in power. We see Saul saying that since God has anointed David, 
if I kill David, then I will remain in control. Hmm. But Saul seems to help us to reflect on the fact that man's ways are not God's ways. Saul helps us to think on the central reflection that man's, man can plan, but God's word stands forever. God had indicated to Saul that his time was up. It was now David's time, but David had to be patient enough to see God work in his life. The Bible says that Saul went after him. And verse 15 says that, And David saw that Saul was come not to have a, a pleasurable discussion, but the Bible allows us to get the gravity of the situation by saying, And David saw that Saul was come out to what? Seek his life. What would David do? Is it that God had forgotten that he was crowned the king when others only saw him as a shepherd boy? My first point for which I want you to reflect on today is that your steps are ordered by God. I want you to remember that. Your steps are ordered by God. Not simply ordered by God, but it is ordered by God because he loves you as an individual personally. Want to repeat? Your steps are ordered by God. And your steps are ordered by God because he loves you. Not because he just wants you to conform, but he loves you personally. The Bible says that David was in the, was in the wilderness of Ziph in a wood. Imagine a king to be, not having the luxuries of the outer court of the palace, but having to contend with a wood. But God, who ordered his steps, was able to keep him wherever he was because God had a bigger plan for his life. But I want us to understand that while God orders our steps, we have a significant responsibility to each other. I remember in one of my young pastorates in Guyana, I took note that every Sabbath, by the time the, old, the closing hymn was sung, a young professional, she would get up out of her seat, head through the door, get into her car, and drive away. After three months, I said to myself that I must be intrusive. I must understand why this routine happens. By the time the closing hymn was being sung, Brother Hallin, I slipped downstairs, got to her car, and met her, and I said, Sis, I've observed such and such. With a smile on her face, she said, Well, Pastor, I have no friends in there. Dumbfounded, unable to answer at that moment, Brother Campbell, I simply said to her that we need to talk on this again. Seven months later, I got a call from my conference president. In a chiding tone, he suggested to me that Sister X was in hospital and not even you, Pastor, went to visit her. I found out the visiting time, got to the hospital, and I was ready to remind her of her comments that she made to me that day. But before reminding her, our conversation naturally went in that direction. And I remember saying to her, my friend, that if you have no friends in there, who do you expect to look for? 
But we are entering the verse 16, and your responsibility to each, and our responsibility to each other in this household of faith. And Jonathan, verse 16, says what? And Jonathan, Saul's son, arose and went to David in the wood and did what? Strengthened his hand in the Lord. I want us to pay attention to that. Saul, aiming to get rid of David to the king, Jonathan would naturally derive benefits from being a king, a king's son. But Jonathan understood that at the time of crisis, people need each other. Jonathan understood that no matter what happened, the personal touch was important. Jonathan, however, did not go to David simply because David was in a palace. He went to David in the harsh realities of the natural environment. He sought him out. He went the extra mile in the wood because he was a friend of David. But I want us to understand that when Jonathan got to David, he did not lament the deficiencies of Saul. He did not lament what branches he can get from David. He did not lament anything else. The Bible is clear that he what? He strengthened the hand of David in the Lord. In other words, he said, David, and we will get to it a little later, I understand all that is happening to you, but you serve a God who is in. He simply said, David, we are in this thing together. And wherever God rocks us, God will take care of us. He said in verse 17, and he said unto him, what? What? Be afraid. He said unto him, what? Fear not, for the hand of Saul, my father, shall not find thee. You see, Jonathan understood the workings of God. And he also understood that in moments of difficulty and pain, God's hands can be obscured or his workings could, be, could seem to be obscured from the sufferer. And it takes those of us on the outside to remind the struggles, to remind everyone about the hand of God. He says what? Fear not, David. You may have been wet by rain last night, but fear not. For the hand of Saul, my father, who has the military might and the army to come after you shall not find you. Then he says to him, and thou shalt be king over Israel, because he understood the word of God. I think many times Satan tries to get us to forget what David himself said. He said what? I had been what? Young. Now I am what? Old. I have what? Never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging bread. I had a good friend. Reggie said to me that the Bible is made up of perfect stories, hmm. Brother Francis. And that's why he cannot believe in the Bible. Hmm. He got a significant promotion in the military in Guyana. And then he called me out to the blues. I heard about the promotion and he says he's about to sit in his office on Monday. And he needs me to come to pray before he gets into his office. Hmm. I said that I'd come at seven. I got, got doing something at seven and I said I'd come at 10. I was busy doing something at 10. I said I'd come at two. He said I gotta come for you or something. I said no, I'd be there by three. <laughs> I got there at three. And the same guy who said to me that he cannot believe in the Bible because it's made up of perfect stories. Hand 
Samuel needed key to his office and said, you go in and pray. I said, why? He says, because the last man who sat in that chair died in the chair. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, saints of God, the point I am making to you is, even though he claimed that the Bible was made up of perfect stories, when death faced him, he understood that there was a God outside of him. So you know, I took the opportunity to re-lecture him before I went into the office. The point I want to make this morning, help me Holy Spirit, is that people need to know about the Lord. Yes, sir. Saul, here, Saul, Jonathan said, and what? I shall be next unto thee, and that also Saul, my father, know it. Hmm. The Bible is a sweet book to read. Yeah. He says, let me tell you something. With all he running after you, he knows that you'll be king. Because he knows that when God speaks, God speaks. Sure. Sure. Bible says in verse 18, and they two what? And they two made a covenant before the Lord. And David abode in the wood, and Jonathan went to his house. Then came the Ziphites, verse 19. Let's look at how things go. Then so Saul and John, David and Jonathan just had this encouraging and faith-building experience, and then came the Ziphites. And the Ziphites then came up the Ziphites to Saul to give him say, Doth not David hide himself with us? Let me translate that. They said, so after this faith building encounter with Jonathan, the Ziphites go to Saul and said, David is with us. You were looking for him, we can give him to you. Doth not David hide himself with us in the strongholds in the wood, in the hill of, ha in the hill of Hakala, which is on the south of Jeshimon. David just had this faith building encounter with Jonathan and the Ziphites now come to literally deliver him on a platter to Saul. <laughs> but the flower faded, man. The grass withered, but the word of God stands. Verse 20. Verse 20. Verse 20 it says, and they are continuing. Now therefore, O king. Pandering the soul's ego and desire for power. Come down according to all the desires of thy soul to come down. And all part shall be to what? Deliver him into the king's hands. An old lady in my village used to say, Life is not lived in straight lines, but God remains constant. <laughs> Life is not lived in straight lines, but God remains constant. These folk are actually saying, come king, whatever you desire, we have him. But the schemes of men can never thwart the working of God and the plans he has for you. Because of his love for you. Verse 21 says what? Verse 21 says, and Saul said, listen to this, look at this, Saul said, Blessed be ye of the Lord, for ye have compassion on me. 22, verse 22. Go, look at this now, Saul was very, very well understood and knew what God had said. Go, I pray you, prepare yet and know and see his place where his haunt is. And who had seen him there? For it is told me that he dealeth very subtly. Paul Saul understood that he may never catch catch David, but he wanted to try one last thing. He says to them, "Go and ensure that he's really there, really, really there, so I can close him, close in, and catch him." Verse 22 says, 23 says, See therefore and take knowledge 
Look at this. If, if, look at not at how Saul is trying to prepare. See therefore and take knowledge of all the lurking places where he hideth himself. And come ye again to me with what? The certainty. And I will go with you and it shall come to pass. If he be in the land that I will search him out throughout all the thousands of Judah. Saul was not leaving any stone unturned because he wanted it. But no matter how men plan, if the steps are not ordered by God, God's will will prevail. Amen. So what I'm simply saying to you, church, is that we've come to a time in our history when our anchor has to be on God. Has to be on his word. Has to be in the faithful sayings of the spirit of prophecy. It has because that's the only keeping power. In 19, probably 2005, I identified my three heroes of the world. Every year I try to identify a hero of the world. But in 19, in 2005, age is catching up with me. I identified three. Don't know who the three were? Saddam Hussein, Hugo Chavez, and Fidel Castro. If you ask me if I'm a communist, I may be tempted to say that the Bible teaches communism, but don't worry about that. The lesson is that Saddam Hussein taught me were evil, men's wicked plots, they're never born forever. But ask God to give you the strength to remain anchored to him. When you look at how Iraq was run, brethren, nothing should have overthrown him. Wickedness does not want I remember picking up my daily newspaper and I have this weird habit. By five o'clock in the morning, I would read the newspaper. And reading that Hugo Chavez had passed a decree to rule for life in Venezuela. Right? But then we all know that Hugo Chavez died. And after dying, they were to embalm his body and place it in a prominent place in Caracas. The embalming went all right and he had to be buried. You know what it taught me? But if God says it's your last day, it's your last day. But my friend Fidel Castro, I love Fidel Castro because I still believe that in terms of his body protection units and, and the guys who surrounded him, it was one of the best in the world. I felt that his medical team was excellent and Fidel Castro lived to rule Cuba. Think about it, friends. That's what he lived for. And then we read that he was attending a public event and he tripped and fell. And I remember arguing with some colleagues of mine that I blame this close and inner protective circle. You're supposed to not be too far ahead of the head of state. You're supposed to be in, it's supposed to look so smooth that he's not supposed to touch the ground. Then we read that he became sick. Cuba that had the best medical system, he went, he got a surgeon from Spain to come to do an operation. And ultimately, Castro had to give up leading Cuba, the thing, the very thing he lived for. And that taught me something, man. It matters not who's your doctor. Hmm. It matters not who surrounds you. Hmm. If God says, it's your last thing. Last. And my one admonition to the church today is that let our faith be built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and his righteousness. I dare not trust what? The sweetest frame, but what? Holy lean on Jesus. I've kept you long enough. Let me push on. Verse 24 says, And they arose and went to Ziph before Saul. 
But David and his men were in the wilderness of Meon, in the plain on the south side of Jeshua. God, when you read what Mrs. White says about this story, you realize that God led David away from the Zephites. That allows me to say, what a mighty God we serve. Verse 25. Verse 25 says, Saul, I want to pay attention to the drama now. Saul also and his men went to seek him. And they told David, Wherefore he came, he, he, he came down into a rock and abode in the wilderness of Zeus, of Meon. And then Saul heard that he pursued after David in the wilderness of Meon. Action, it's battle, verse 26. Verse 26 says, And Saul went, pay attention to this now, and Saul went on this side of the mountain, and David and his men on that side of the mountain. And David made haste to get away for fear of Saul. For Saul and his men compassed David and his men round about to take them. In other words, when Saul was going on this side, David was coming on that side. Geographically, Saul had boxed David into a corner. Is it that Saul had military might and geographic knowledge that David didn't have? But I want to tell you that even in that situation where they had encircled David, it was a moment for glory to God. But verse 27 says what? While they're now about to catch up with David, it says what? But there came a messenger unto Saul, saying, Haste thee and come, for the Philistines have invaded the land. Reading this story from the inception, we would think that for David to get through, there would have to be a brutal fight. But God had other plans. When Saul had closed in on David, out of the blues, a messenger comes and says, the Philistines have invaded the land. A better translation should have said, suddenly a messenger came. Another translation should have said, as he was about to, to capture Saul, suddenly a messenger came. And the final verse says what? Verse 28. Wherefore, Saul returned from pursuing after David and went against the Philistines. Therefore, they called the name of the place and you will pronounce that in their own time. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I end by saying, there is no situation that can face you that you and God cannot handle. Amen. Amen. David geographically, when you study this thing geographically, Saul had the edge, David faced a cliff. Saul had compassed him. Out of the blues, a messenger said, Go home, Saul. Philistines are in the God's ways are not our ways. And I don't know and understand what you are facing today. What you think you are facing today, what confronts you, what happens to you, but there is nothing. I want you to, to hold to this, man. Every little boy, every little girl, there is nothing that will face you in this life that you and God can have. I might not be here for you. Brother Francis might be too busy for you. Brother Hallie might get his doctorate and forget about those who don't have doctorates. <laughs> but Jesus never leaves you. And I end by telling you the story of fish. Fish grew up in a village, nine siblings. Told him last night in a text message and he said, I'm sure you tell the whole story, but I can't tell the whole story. <laughs> fish walked on that crusade tent at about age. 15. His name was Fish Reggie because all he did in the village was catch fish, ate fish, smell like fish, and look like fish. 
When the final altar call was made, Fish walked up and Fish gave his life to Christ. Fish was the final person to be baptized because nobody wanted to encounter a fishy baptismal movement. Fish came into church, but Fish suddenly started to lead song service. But it was noted by us as young men that Fish only sang three songs. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, mm -hmm. my maker and my king, and give me the Bible. Me, the naughty person I was, I inquired from Fish why he only sang those songs. Oh, but in addition to that, when AY came around and it was asked for his favorite text, Fish favorite text for two, three years used to be Psalm 23, verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Ladies and gentlemen, if Fish was here today, he would have told you. Fish decided that he wanted to get into school, got into school, etc. But if you ask him why he only sung those three songs, he said that there was an old lady in church that who would who started to teach him to read. And so what he started to do is to go over those songs consistently until he mastered reading, mastered it, mastered it, mastered it. Fish enrolled in 1998 to do a degree in physics, brethren, at the University of Guyana. In November of this year, Fish is going to graduate in Italy with a PhD in medical physics. He said, tell them the whole story. Tell them the story that Jesus was able to transform fish into a man that touches bodies and heal them. Mm -hmm. He said, tell them, tell them also that I left the church at one point. Tell them that there's nothing that can happen to them that Jesus is there to handle. Mm -hmm. You know what he really wanted me to tell you? At the point when he was sinking financially, right in Italy, but again, he was, he was hired to be a research assistant with a professor and discovered a mathematical flaw after the paper was reviewed by several other scholars. And that allowed them to give him a scholarship to study. So he generally says, God, I used to be paying them to study, paying them to study. Now God allowed them to pay me to study. You know, I share that story with you folks. I, I want from the bottom of my heart to say, don't give up on God. Mm, yes, sir. He has not given up on you. Praise the Lord. Don't tell me a story. Don't even tell the pastor your story. Tell it to Jesus. Yes, sir. For he will work. The because the game that Satan is playing with your life yes. is over. Praise mm. Because God's in charge. Amen. Blessings, everybody. Amen. Praise the Lord.